Tell us, when will these things be, and what will be the sign of your coming, and of the end of the age? Our subject today, when will the rapture happen? Everybody wants to know, is the rapture going to be before the tribulation, in the middle of the tribulation or at the end of the tribulation? This is actually the question that we receive most here at End Time Ministries. I guess one of the reasons that we receive this question is because people know that I believe that the church will be on the earth during the Great Tribulation. Now, first of all, believing in a pre-tribulation rapture or a post-tribulation rapture is not a salvation issue. Any of us could be snatched out into eternity without a moment's notice today. Therefore, this question should never be allowed to become a cause for division among Christians, and that's really important. I've published in Time Magazine for 21 years, and even though I believe in a post-tribulation rapture, I've never put that in our magazine because I wanted in Time Magazine to be a soul-winning tool, not a debating forum. So then the question arises, so why address it now after all this time? Well, there's a reason. All the prophetic fulfillments are converging together to indicate that we're very close to the beginning of that final seven-year period called Daniel's 70th week. Some people believe the entire seven years is the Great Tribulation. Others say, no, the Great Tribulation is the last half, three and a half years, regardless it looks like we're real close to the beginning of that time. Consequently, it's starting to affect everything we do. Number one, it affects the mindset of the church. Should we be preparing to disappear suddenly in a pre-trib rapture? Or should we be gearing up for the greatest evangelistic thrust the church has ever known as these prophetic events progress. We should be taking advantage of them, showing people, look, what's happening in our world right now is prophesied in the Bible. Now, the second thing that we need to look at is the danger of incorrect beliefs. Let's say that you're pre-tribulation, and it's not true. Some people are so adamantly pre-trib that if the mark of the beast showed up today, they would take it. They would say, well, this can't be the real mark of the beast because I won't be here at that time. This must simply be a precursor. Consequently, if they hold to that doctrine too strong and it's incorrect, they could inadvertently take the mark of the beast. Now, this would result in them being forever damned, obviously. So that's another reason why it's important as we enter the times immediately ahead that we really know what the Bible says. So let's look at what the Bible actually says about when the rapture will take place. Let's set aside preconceived ideas. It doesn't matter what the commentaries say or anyone says. It matters what the Bible says. And the Bible's real clear on this point. So that's what we're going to do today. We're going to take a look at it. Now, being privileged to be born into a wonderful Christian home, I was told that the rapture would take place before the tribulation, and then there would be seven years of great tribulation. So I grew up believing in a pre-tribulation rapture because that's what I was told was true. But when I began to travel as an evangelist holding revival meetings, I would often preach that the rapture of the church could occur at any moment. However, there were some scriptures that bothered me about that statement. So I began to study The first place I went was to the words of Jesus Christ himself, and that's the best place, of course, to go. The most famous prophecy chapter of the entire Bible, Matthew chapter 24. When did Jesus say the rapture would occur? 
Here it is, Matthew 24, verse 29 through 31. Listen to Jesus. Immediately after the tribulation of those days shall the sun be darkened and the moon shall not give her light and the stars shall fall from heaven and the powers of the heavens shall be shaken and then shall appear the sign of the Son of Man in heaven and then shall all the tribes of the earth mourn and they shall see the Son of Man coming in the clouds of heaven with power and great glory. And he shall send his angels with the great sound of a trumpet and they shall gather together his elect from the four winds, from one end of heaven to the other. Okay, Jesus said immediately after the tribulation of those days, shall the Lord send his angels with the great sound of a trumpet, and they shall gather them together. They will gather his elect from the four winds, from one end of heaven to the other. I said to my dad, Dad, it says right here, immediately after the tribulation. Well, Dad was not a prophecy scholar. He couldn't answer me. And so every time a minister would come through, he'd say, ask him. So I would, we had all kinds of interesting discussions around our home over this issue because I felt like I needed to know. Well, the most famous argument against this being the rapture is they say, but he's going to gather the elect. The elect is the Jews. But is it? What does the Bible say about that? I looked up the word elect in my concordance, it's 13 times in the book, in the New Testament. And to my amazement, it never referred to the Jews one time. It always referred to the church. A couple of times it referred to angels. But let me give you some sample scriptures. Colossians chapter 3, verse 12, Paul wrote and said, Put on therefore as the elect of God, holy and beloved, bowels of mercies, kindness, humbleness of mind, meekness, long-suffering. Who's he talking to here? He's talking to the Colossian church. So he calls them the elect. And then he writes to the church at Rome in Romans 8, 33. And he says, Who shall lay anything to the charge of God's elect? It is God that justifieth. And so he again is speaking to the church, calling them the elect. Then finally, in Romans chapter number 11, verse 7, this is really clear. What then? Israel hath not obtained that which he seeketh for, but the election hath obtained it, and the rest were blinded. So it plainly says here, Israel has not attained it, but the election has, which disproves completely that Israel is not the elect. The elect is the church. When he gathers his elect, he's coming to gather his church. Now, further on in the book of Matthew, there's commentary about this same coming. I mean, the coming here is in verse 31, but then in verse number 36, it says, but of that day and hour knoweth no man no, not the angels of heaven, but my Father only. But as the days of Noah were, so shall also the coming of the Son of Man be. Now, these are scriptures that people use to preach a pre-tribulation rapture. But this is commentary about the gathering together unto him that's mentioned in verse number 31. This is simply a continuation of the narrative here. He goes on to say in verse 38, For as in the days of Noah that were before the flood, they were eating and drinking, marrying and giving in marriage until the day that Noah entered into the ark and knew not until the flood came and took them all away. So shall the coming of the Son of Man be. Which coming? The coming I just mentioned in verse number 31. So all of these passages point right back to the coming of the Lord that happens, quote, immediately after the tribulation of those days. It goes on to say in verse number 40 of Matthew 24, then shall two be in the field. One shall be taken, the other left. Two women will be grinding at the mill. All of a sudden, one taken, the other left. Watch therefore, for you know not what hour your Lord doth come. All of this I had heard all my life used to preach a pre-trib rapture. But when I saw it in the Bible, it was obviously commentary 
about the rapture that takes place immediately after the tribulation of those days in Matthew 24, verse number 29 through 31. Well, I had serious questions now, and I was trying to find the answers to it. Then I went back before verse 29 through 31, and I began to look at what Jesus was saying to them would happen during the tribulation. Now, the tribulation begins in verse 15 at the abomination of desolation. Verse 21 says, For then shall be great tribulation such as never has been before, no, nor ever again shall be. In verse 23, Jesus talking to His church, His disciples said to them, Then if any man shall say unto you, Lo, here is Christ, or there. Now this is during the tribulation. Believe it not. For there shall arise false Christ and false prophets and shall show great signs and wonders insomuch that if it were possible, they shall deceive the very elect. Jesus said during the great tribulation, there's going to be a lot of deception Verse 25, Behold, I have told you before. Wherefore, if they shall say unto you, Behold, he's in the desert. Messiah is out in the desert. He showed up. The second coming is happening. He's out there doing miracles. When they say he's in the desert, don't go forth. Or they say, Behold, he's in the secret chambers. Don't believe it. Verse 27, Why should you not believe those reports? Because The Messiah is not coming back that way. When I come back, verse 27 says, For as the lightning cometh out of the east and shineth even unto the west, so shall also the coming of the Son of Man be. I'm not going to be born uh, in a stable and laid in a manger this time. I'm not going to slip into the back door of the world. When I come the next time, I'm coming with the clouds of heaven. I'm coming with the sound of a great trumpet and every eye shall behold me. So, as the lightning flashes out of the east, even unto the west, so shall the coming of the Son of Man be. And this is commentary he's talking to them about during the tribulation. Now, if we're already raptured by then, we're not even going to be here. Why is he warning us not to believe these false reports about the appearing of Messiah? Obviously, Jesus knew the church would be here during that time. Now, let's look at another angle from will the church be here during the tribulation. In Revelation chapter number 20, verse number 4, there's some commentary about the first resurrection. Listen to it. John said, And I saw thrones, and they sat upon them, and judgment was given unto them, and I saw the souls of them that were beheaded for the witness of Jesus And for the word of God, and which had not worshipped the beast, neither his image, neither had received his mark upon their foreheads or in their hands, and they lived and reigned with Christ a thousand years. Now he's talking about people that had not taken the mark, they had not worshipped the beast, and it goes on to say that they lived and reigned with Christ a thousand years. But the rest of the dead lived not again until the thousand years were finished. This is the first resurrection. I said, wait a minute. Now, I was still pre-trib at this time when I saw this passage. And the people that didn't take the mark, that would not worship the beast during the tribulation, it says that they're resurrected. And when they are, this is the first resurrection. And I remember thinking, if this is the first resurrection, what's my resurrection that I've been preaching happened seven years before this? I understood right then that all my questions about Matthew 24 were valid questions. He goes on to say here in verse number 6 of Revelation 20, Blessed and holy is he that hath part in the first resurrection. On such the second death hath no power. But they shall be priests of God and of Christ and shall reign with him a thousand years. Ladies and gentlemen, if this is the first resurrection. There wasn't a resurrection seven years prior to this because then this would not be the first one, this one that happens after the tribulation of those days. Well, I kept studying because I wanted to be sure. And I went to 2 Thessalonians chapter number 2, verse number 1. The Apostle Paul 
was responding to a teaching that was happening in the Thessalonican church. There were people that were teaching that the second coming of Christ was imminent. It's about to happen. Well, the apostle Paul knew that was not true, that there was going to be a big letdown. So he wrote to the Thessalonican church to correct this incorrect teaching. Notice here in 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, verse number 1, Paul said, Now we beseech you, brethren, by the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ and by our gathering together unto him, that ye be not soon shaken in mind or be troubled, neither by spirit nor by word nor by letter as from us, as that the day of Christ is at hand or is imminent. Let no man deceive you by any means, for that day shall not come except two things happen. There come a falling away first, and that man of sin be revealed, the son of perdition, referring to the Antichrist. Now notice in verse number one, what's the subject? I beseech you by the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ and our gathering together unto him, which takes place at his coming. So the subject is our, the churches gathering together unto him. Then he said, that day shall not come, verse 3, except there come a falling away first. Now, I believe the falling away is the dark ages. Remember, this is the apostle Paul speaking in the first century. We have this period of time from about 500 A.D. until about 1500 A.D. People couldn't even have Bibles. It was against the law to have a Bible. The priest didn't want people reading their Bibles. They felt like the people would get so confused. Well, they would because what was being taught in the church by that time was not the same thing as was being taught in the Bible. So they didn't even want them to have their Bibles. So it was a time of darkness. Plus, most people couldn't read or write anyway at the time in order to read their Bibles. Plus, they were too expensive because they were all hand-produced and no one could afford them. Consequently, It was during this time that there was a great falling away. History calls it the Dark Ages, I believe. That's what the Apostle Paul foresaw here. He said that day will not come except there come this falling away first. And then the man of sin, the Antichrist, will be revealed. So until the Antichrist is revealed, our gathering together unto him will not take place. Now think about that. This is what the Apostle Paul is teaching us. Now, let's look at the two most famous accounts of the rapture in the Bible. In 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, verse 16 through 17, the Apostle Paul said, For the Lord himself shall descend from heaven with a shout, with the voice of the archangel, and with the trump of God, and the dead in Christ shall rise first. Then we which are alive and remain shall be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air, and so shall we ever be with the Lord. Now here's a resurrection, because the dead in Christ are going to raise from the dead first. Then we which are alive and remain will be caught up together with them to meet the Lord in the air. So this is the resurrection. If, if the first resurrection happens after the tribulation, then this has to happen after the tribulation, which I believe it does. So notice here, the dead in Christ rise first, then Christians that are still alive on the earth will be changed from mortal to immortality and be caught up together with them all together to meet the Lord in the air. The other most famous passage is 1 Corinthians chapter number 15, verse 51. Paul again writing, Behold, I show you a mystery. We shall not all sleep, but we shall all be changed. In a moment, in the twinkling of an eye, at the last trump. Notice there was a trumpet in 1 Thessalonians chapter 4. Here it is again. Notice there's a trumpet in Matthew chapter number 24, verse uh, 29 through 31. Every time there's a trumpet, in a moment, in the twinkling of an eye, at the last trump. For the trumpet shall sound, and the dead shall be raised incorruptible, and we shall be changed. Well, that brings up a question. It says, this rapture is going to happen at the last trump. When is the last trump? Well, the last trump is taught in Revelation chapter number 11 and verse number 15. Listen to this. You know, there are seven trumpets that sound in the book of Revelation. 
The seventh one, the last one sounds. Listen to Revelation eleven fifteen. And the seventh angel sounded, and there were great voices in heaven saying, The kingdoms of this world are become the kingdoms of our Lord and of His Christ, and He shall reign forever. Now, it's at the last trump when Jesus comes, puts down the thrones of men, and is crowned King of kings and Lord of lords. So this is the account of Him setting up His kingdom. Now, if the rapture happens at the same time, then this all fits because the Apostle Paul said the rapture happens at the last trump. And that's also when the kingdoms of this world will become the kingdoms of our Lord and of His Christ. So all of the scriptures agree. Immediately after the tribulation is coming, the first resurrection happens after the great tribulation. And here we see it again, the last trumpet happens after the tribulation when the kingdoms of this world become the kingdoms of our Lord and His Christ. It goes on to say here in Revelation chapter number 11, verse 18 and 19, and the nations were angry. This is at the last trump. And thy wrath is come, and the time of the dead that they should be judged, and that thou shouldest give reward unto thy servants, the prophets, and to the saints. You mean that happens at the last trump when the kingdoms of this world become the kingdoms of our Lord and His Christ? That's what it says right here. And them that fear thy name, small and great, and shouldest destroy them which destroy the earth. And the temple of God was opened in heaven, and there was seen in his temple the ark of his testament, and there were lightnings and voices and thunderings and earthquakes and great hail. You're going to see that many times at the time of the rapture, over and over again. So it's at the last trump when the kingdoms of this world become the kingdom of our Lord and his Christ. So let's think about where we are right now. All right, we've looked at Matthew chapter number 24 when Jesus Christ himself said that immediately after the tribulation of those days shall the sun be darkened, the moon shall not give her light. Then shall appear the sign of the coming of the Son of Man and he will gather his elect. We showed you that the elect is the church. And then right after that, immediately we go into and of that day and hour knoweth no man However, two will be in the field. One will be taken, the other left. A lot of people think everybody's going to know it's rapture time, that it's Armageddon time. But you're going to find as we go through these passages of Scripture that that is simply not true. Then also in Matthew 24, he said, Now, uh, during the tribulation, if you hear reports of Messiah out in the desert, Or if you hear reports of Messiah in some secret place somewhere, Lord Maitreya in London, some of you have heard that report. He said, don't worry about it because it's not happening that way. As the lightning flashes from the east to the west, so shall the coming of the Son of Man be. And he's commenting to them about the conditions during the Great Tribulation. He doesn't want them to be deceived by false reports of the second coming of the Messiah during the Great Tribulation. Then again, I remember I wrestled with this. Nobody could answer my questions. But when I got to Revelation chapter 20 and I looked there where those people who had lived through the great tribulation, they had not taken the mark and they had not worshiped the beast and they were resurrected and they lived and reigned with Christ. That means they're part of the rapture. That means they're part of the kingdom of God. They're going to rule and reign as kings and priests with Jesus Christ. When I saw that, And it said, when they're raptured at the end of the tribulation, this is the first resurrection. That was the final nail in my pre-trib coffin. I thought, if this is the first resurrection, that means the church is going to go through the great tribulation period. And then when I saw 2 Thessalonians chapter number 2, where the apostle Paul said, Do not be worried. Do not be troubled by this teaching of an imminent coming. That day will not come except there comes this falling away first and the man of sin be revealed. So the Antichrist, the Apostle Paul, very clearly stated there, the Antichrist must be revealed before the rapture will take place. And it was in plain, it was plain as it could be. That day shall not come except the Antichrist is revealed. And when I saw that, I realized that I had to change my mind. 
I remember my wife saying to me when I told her what I was studying, she said, oh, you can't teach that. My pastor said, anybody that teaches the church is going through the tribulation is a false prophet. Well, you know, I didn't want to be a false prophet, but I did want to teach what the Bible says. Now, in the next segment, we're going to study several accounts of the two simultaneous harvests that are described in Scripture. You're going to see three different times that the harvest of the wheat and the harvest of the tares all happens at the exact same time. Now, we're not looking at my opinion or the opinion of someone else. We're simply going through the Bible. What does the Bible say? Because this is going to affect you. It's going to affect me. Are we ready for the church to be the church it needs to be for this world in these critical times that are just ahead? We're continuing our study. When will the rapture happen? Let's quickly review what we learned in our first segment. One, Jesus taught the rapture would occur immediately after the tribulation, Matthew 24, 29 through 31. Two, when those killed during the tribulation are resurrected, the Bible says this is the first resurrection, Revelation 20, verse 4 through 6. Number three, our gathering together unto him cannot happen until the Antichrist is revealed. That's 2 Thessalonians 2, verse 1 through 3. And number four, the rapture happens at the last trump when the kingdoms of this world become the kingdoms of our Lord and His Christ. That's 1 Corinthians chapter number 15 and Revelation chapter number 11, verse 15 through 19. Now, today we're going to look, or at least in this segment, we're going to look at the two simultaneous harvests. This is such an interesting passage, again, spoken by Jesus himself. Matthew chapter 13, verse number 24. Listen to it. Another parable, put he forth unto them, saying, The kingdom of heaven is likened unto a man which sowed good seed in his field. But while men slept, his enemy came and sowed tares among the wheat and went his way. But when the blade was sprung up and brought forth fruit, then appeared the tares also. So the servants of the house, householder came and said unto him, Sir, didst not thou sow good seed in thy field? From whence then hath it tares? He said unto them, An enemy hath done this. The servant said unto him, Will thou then that we go and gather them up, pull the tares out? He said, Nay lest while ye gather up the tares, ye root up also the wheat with them. Let both grow together until the harvest. And in the time of harvest, I will say to the reapers, gather ye together first the tares and bind them in bundles to burn them, but gather the wheat into my barn. Now this is the story of the two simultaneous harvest. They both happen at the same time, the harvest of the wheat and the harvest of the tares. Now, Jesus went on in verse 36 through 43 to explain every detail of the parable. He said, the good seed is the children of the kingdom. The tares are the children of the wicked one. The enemy that sowed the tares is the devil. The harvest is the end of the world or the end of the age. And the reapers are the angels. So it's important to realize the wheat and the tares were both harvested at the same time. Now there's another account of these two simultaneous harvests in the book of Revelation, chapter number 14, verse number 14. And I looked and behold a white cloud and upon the cloud, one set like the Son of Man, having on his head a golden crown, and in his hand a sharp sickle. And another angel came out of the temple, crying with a loud voice to him that sat on the cloud, Thrust in thy sickle and reap, for the time is come for thee to reap, for the harvest of the earth is ripe. And he that sat on the cloud thrust in his sickle on the earth, and the earth was reaped. Now this is the harvest of the earth. This is the harvest of the wheat. 
This is the rapture. Now, after verse 16, in verse 17, we see the harvest of the tares. Here it is. And another angel came out of the temple, which is in heaven. He also having a sharp sickle. And another angel came out from the altar, which had power over fire, and cried with a loud cry to him that had the sharp sickle, saying, Thrust in thy sharp sickle and gather the clusters of the vine of the earth, not the harvest of the earth, the vine of the earth, for her grapes are fully ripe. And the angel thrust in his sickle into the earth and gathered the vine of the earth and cast it into the great winepress of the wrath of God. And the winepress was trodden without the city and blood came out of the winepress even until the horse bridles by the space of a thousand and six hundred furlongs. So the, he gathers the vine of the earth, throws it into the winepress of the wrath of God. This is speaking of the battle of Armageddon. And the winepress was trodden without the city. Speaking of Jerusalem, that's where the battle of Armageddon will end up. And when Jesus comes, he is going to go through the Kidron Valley just outside the Temple Mount. And he will tread down the enemies of God's people. And that is the battle of Armageddon. The Bible says that blood will flow to the horse bridles by the space of 1,600 furlongs. That's 160 miles. There's actually 160 miles from the plain of Megiddo in the north over to the Jordan Valley, down the Jordan Valley, and then into the entrance to Jerusalem. So this is a prophecy of the battle of Armageddon. So in verse number 14 through 16, we have the harvest of the wheat. Verse 17 through verse number 20, we have the harvest of the vine of the earth, of the tares, and they're cast into the battle of, the Arm of Armageddon. Again, two simultaneous harvests. Now let's pause a moment to look at the last minute warning. I love this passage of Scripture. It's Revelation 16, and it happens under the sixth vial. As you know, there are seven trumpets, seven seals, seven trumpets, seven vials. And under the sixth vial, God said that the vial was poured out upon the Euphrates River. The Euphrates River would be dried up to make way for the kings of the east to come down against Israel at the Battle of Armageddon. It also states during this time that three spears like frogs come out of the mouth of the dragon, the beast, and the false prophet. And the purpose of these spirits is to gather, influence the kings of the earth to gather unto the great battle of God Almighty. So that's recorded in verse 12 through 14. Watch what happens in verse 15. Listen to it. Behold, I come as a thief. Blessed is he that watcheth and keepeth his garments, lest he walk naked and they see his shame. So this is, I call this the last minute warning because it's almost Armageddon time. The armies are already together and the Euphrates River is being dried up. And then after he gives this last minute warning, behold, I come as a thief. Make sure you're ready. Keep your garments. Then he says in verse 16, and he gathered them together into a place called in the Hebrew tongue Armageddon. Once again, the rapture happens at the time of Armageddon. Now that's not all that happens here because this is so interesting. Immediately in verse 17, we move into the seventh vial. Listen to the events of the seventh vial. And the seventh angel poured out his vial into the air, and there came a great voice out of the temple of heaven from the throne saying, It is done. Wow. It is done. And there were voices and thunders and lightnings, and there was a great earthquake, such as was not since men were upon the earth, so mighty an earthquake and so great. And the great city was divided into three parts, and the city of the nations fell, and great Babylon came in remembrance before God to give unto her the cup of the wine of the fierceness of his wrath. Now, it's the same thing. Armageddon was referred to as the wine press, the fierceness of the wrath of God. Here we are again, two chapters later. God's talking about it all over again. So let's look at the events of the seventh vial. Number one, history's greatest earthquake, an earthquake such as was not since men were upon the earth. 
and this earthquake is going to divide the great city, Jerusalem, into three parts. The Bible says the Mount of Olives will clean it, cleave into two, part toward the north, part toward the south. The Bible also says in chapter number 11 of Revelation that 7,000 will die in Jerusalem in this earthquake. It also states here that great Babylon came up in remembrance before God. So God's wrath is going to be poured out upon great Babylon, which in other places referred to as mystery Babylon, which is Rome. And so the Rome is going to be totally destroyed by this earthquake. And then it also states under the seventh vial that there's going to be a great hail, each stone weighing about a talent. I can't tell you for sure how heavy a talent is. One table I saw said a talent was 125 pounds. Can you imagine God raining hailstones down upon the people trying to invade Israel at Armageddon, hailstones that weigh 125 pounds. The Bible says that men blaspheme God because of the hail. Okay, now that's the sixth and seventh vial. Let's now look at the next two chapters because he talks about the judgment of great Babylon. The times come to judge Babylon. He stops and devotes two chapters, two entire chapters of the book of Revelation. There's only 22 chapters total. He takes two of the 22 to talk about the judgment of mystery Babylon, the false religious system. God must really hate this false religious system. Why shouldn't he? Uh, This false religious system is going to deceive people into thinking they're saved when they're not and going to cause many, many people to be lost. And God said, I am going to pour out my judgment upon that false religious system. Now, when this happens, you're going to notice that the people in heaven are praising God for the judgment of the great whore. Listen to it. Verse number one of chapter, well, first of all, chapter 17 and 18, you can read it for yourself later. It, the whole thing's devoted to the judgment of Babylon. But when you get to chapter 19, verse one through three, reiterates this. Listen to it. And after these things, I heard a great voice of much people in heaven saying, Alleluia, salvation and glory and honor and power unto the Lord our God. For true and righteous are his judgments. For he hath judged the great whore, which did corrupt the earth. She corrupted the earth with her fornication, both spiritual fornication and physical fornication. And hath avenged the blood of the servants at her hand. She's killed many Christians, but God has now avenged their blood at her hand. And again they said, Alleluia, and her smoke rose up forever and forever. So God judges the harlot church in verses 1 through 3, and we're going to find out that in verses 6 through 8, He then marries the virgin church. So he judges the false church that's masquerading under his name. He judges the false church in verse 1 through 3 and then turns around and marries the virgin church that's been faithful to his word in verse 6 through 9. Let's take a look now at the marriage. Now, here we are in chapter 19, and the marriage Supper of the Lamb is just getting ready to take place. Verse 6, And I heard, as it were, the voice of a great multitude, and as the voice of many waters, and as the voice of mighty thundering, saying, Alleluia, for the Lord God omnipotent reigneth. Let us be glad and rejoice and give honor to him, for the marriage of the Lamb is come. We're just now getting ready for the rapture, for the marriage of the Lamb. And his wife hath made herself ready. And to her was granted that she should be arrayed in fine linen, clean and white. For the fine linen is the righteousness of the saints. And he saith unto me, Write, blessed are they which are called unto the marriage supper of the Lamb. So here's the marriage supper. We're still talking about two simultaneous harvests here. Because immediately in verse 11 through 15, we see the description again of the battle of Armageddon. So we have the marriage supper of the Lamb to his bride, his virgin bride, the church. In verse 6 through 9, in verse 11 through 15, again we see the battle of Armageddon. Let's look at it. And I saw 
heaven opened, and behold, a white horse, and he that sat upon him was called Faithful and True, and in righteousness he doth judge and make war. His eyes were as a flame of fire, and his, on his head were many crowns, and he had a name written that no man knew but he himself. And he was clothed with a vesture dipped in blood, and his name is called the Word of God. Now we know who that is, because John chapter 1 says, In the beginning was the Word, the Word was with God, the Word was God. And in verse 14 of chapter 1, it states, And the Word of God was made flesh and dwelt among us. It's speaking of Jesus Christ. So this is Jesus Christ. His name is called the Word of God. And the armies which were in heaven followed him upon white horses, clothed in fine linen, white and clean. And out of his mouth goeth a sharp sword, that with it he should smite the nations, and he shall rule them with a rod of iron. And he treadeth the winepress of the fierceness and wrath of Almighty God. So we see the winepress in chapter 14. We see the winepress in chapter 16. Now we see the winepress again in chapter 19. It's the same event being told from different angles to us. So two simultaneous harvests. The harvest of the wheat, the bride, here in chapter number 19, uh, verse 6 through 9, and now the harvest of the tares thrown into the battle of Armageddon, uh, verse number 11 through verse number 15. Okay, you say, well, I'm sort of confused here. There's so much going on here. There is. There are several accounts of the rapture in the book of Revelation. So let's look at each of them right now. The first account in the book of Revelation is chapter number 6, verse 12 through 17. This is the sixth and seventh seal. Now let's just read it. And I beheld when he had opened the sixth seal, and lo, there was a great earthquake, and the sun became black as sackcloth of hair, and the moon became as blood, and the stars of heaven fell upon the earth. We've read that before in other places, haven't we? Even as a fig tree casteth her untimely figs when she is shaken of a mighty wind, and the heaven departed as a scroll when it is rolled together, And every mountain and island were moved out of their places. The heavens were opened. This is the appearing of Jesus Christ. Verse 15, And the kings of the earth, and the great men, and the rich men, and the chief captains, and the mighty men, and every bondman, and every free man, hid themselves in the dens and in the rocks of the mountains. It goes on to say in verse 16, And said to the mountains and rocks, Fall on us and hide us from the face of him that sitteth on the throne and from the wrath of the Lamb. For the great day of his wrath is come, and who shall be able to stand? There he is. Hide us from his face. Heavens depart. Jesus appears. The great day of his wrath is come. Who shall be able to stand? It's Armageddon time. Well, then immediately we go into the seventh seal. And the seventh seal, what happens there is there's 30 minutes of silence in heaven. There's a lot of speculation about what the 30 minutes of silence really is. I have an opinion. I believe that the 30 minutes of silence in heaven is when all of heaven is in awe watching the marriage take place. Jesus leaves heaven comes to the earth, his bride is caught up to meet him in the air and they have that marvelous marriage supper in the sky and all heaven is watching in awe. The Bible says there will be 30 minutes of silence in heaven and that's right at the time of the marriage of the Lamb. That's right at the time of the rapture as Jesus prepares to go down for the battle of Armageddon. Now we see another account of this rapture in Revelation eleven fifteen 15 through 19. We've already looked at it briefly, but let's go through it. Verse 15, And the seventh angel sounded, we're talking about the last trumpet now, and there were great voices in heaven saying, The kingdoms of this world become the kingdoms of our Lord and of His Christ, and He shall reign forever and ever. And the nations were angry, and thy wrath is come, and the time of the dead that they should be judged, and that thou shouldest give reward unto thy servants, the prophets, and the saints 
and them that fear thy name, small and great, and shouldest destroy them which destroy the earth. And the temple of God was opened in heaven, and there were seen in his temple the ark of the testament, and there were lightnings and voices and thunderings and earthquake and great hail. Hey, we saw the earthquake and the great hail uh, back there uh, under the 16th chapter of Revelation, under the sixth vial. Now here we see the same thing in Revelation 11, because it is the same thing. These are different accounts of the rapture. Once again, we see it in Revelation 14. Again, we were just here, but let's look at it one more time. And I looked and behold, this is verse number 14 of Revelation 14. I looked and behold a white cloud and upon the cloud, one set like the son of man, having in his hand a golden, or having on his head a golden crown and in his hand a sharp sickle. And another angel came out of the temple crying with a loud voice to him that sat on the cloud, thrust in your sickle and reap for the time has come for thee to reap for the harvest of the earth is ripe. And he that sat on the cloud thrust in his sickle on the earth and the earth was reaped. So there we have again, we've got rapture in chapter number six, rapture in chapter number 11 at the last trump. Now we've got this rapture here in Revelation 14. And then we get back over to Revelation 16, verse number 15. Behold, I come as a thief. Blessed is he that watcheth and keepeth his garments, lest he walk naked and they see his shame. And he gathered them together into a place called in the Hebrew tongue Armageddon. Again, the last minute warning. This is under the sixth and seventh vial. Uh, let's see what finally happens. We now go to Revelation 19, verse 7 through 11. This is the picture of the rapture. Actually, the warning was Revelation chapter 16. Now in chapter 19, after the two chapters given to the judgment of the great harlot, now in chapter 19, here we have the rapture. Let us be glad and rejoice and give honor to him. For the marriage of the Lamb is come, and his wife hath made herself ready. And to her was granted that she should be arrayed in fine linen, white and clean. For the fine linen is the righteousness of saints. And he saith unto me, Write, blessed are they which are called unto the marriage supper of the Lamb. And I saw heaven open. There we have it again. It's open in chapter number six, every place. And I saw heaven open and behold a white horse. And he that sat upon him was called faithful and true. And in righteousness he doth judge and make war. So here we have the rapture of the church again, the marriage supper of the Lamb. So let's put some order to all of this. Now the book of Revelation is a dramatization of the second coming of Jesus Christ. The first verse actually states in chapter 1, the revelation of Jesus Christ or the revealing of Jesus Christ. So the whole book of Revelation is devoted to the revealing, to the second coming, and it's told over and over again like we have Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John telling the account of the life of Christ. Well, the second coming is so important that God takes an entire book, the book of Revelation, to talk about this crowning event, this capstone on all the plan of God since the beginning. And he tells the story in the book of Revelation. Now, there are three categories of information in Revelation. Chapter 1, verse 19 tells us, Write the things thou hast seen, and the things which are, and the things which shall be hereafter. Those are the three categories of the book of Revelation. The things thou hast seen, and the things which are, are in Revelation chapter 1, 2, and 3. That's the messages to the churches that existed on the earth at that time, over which John later became the overseer after he was released from exile. Then, in verse number 4, Chapter number four, verse number one, we move into the prophetic portion of the book of Revelation. Listen to it. After this, I looked and behold, a door was opened in heaven and the first voice which I heard was as it were of a trumpet talking with me, which said, come up hither, I will show thee things which must be hereafter. Some people say that's the rapture of the church, but it's not. It's simply he is leaving the things that thou hast seen and the things which are and moving into the things which shall be hereafter. Come up hither, John, I will show thee things which must be hereafter. So there are three sevens in the book of Revelation. Seven seals, seven trumpets, seven vials. Each one ends with the second coming. So the 
Six and seven seal, second coming. The seventh trumpet, second coming. The sixth and seventh vial, second coming. All end at the rapture and all end at the battle of Armageddon. Now here's the most important thing. The most important thing is be ready. Be ready for any of us could die today. That's critical whether you believe pre-trib or post-trib. You must be ready. Now in the last two segments, I've taught why I was forced to change my mind from believing in a pre-tribulation rapture to believing in a post-tribulation rapture. I know there are many questions that still need to be answered. So in the next segment, we're going to take time to answer some of the common objections to the post-tribulation rapture view. In the meantime, don't forget, don't let this be a point of division with you, with your pastor, with your church, because the most important thing we all have to remember is be ye ready. That's what's important. In our first two segments of When Will the Rapture Happen?, we offered several proofs that the church will be raptured at the end of the Great Tribulation. Matthew 24, 29 specifically states that the rapture will happen immediately after the tribulation of those days, the words of Jesus Christ himself. And then in Revelation chapter 20, verse 4 through 6, it states there that people who refuse the mark of the beast, that would not worship the image of the beast, some of them were killed for that. And when they were resurrected, it specifically says there, this is the first resurrection. Obviously, if it's the first resurrection, there was not a resurrection seven years prior to this. Now, during our first segment, we pointed out that the Apostle Paul in 2 Thessalonians chapter number 2, verse 1 through 3, addressed the timing of the second coming of Jesus Christ. He said, I would uh, have you to know, I beseech you by the coming of our Lord and our gathering together unto him. The subject is the gathering of the church unto him that that day shall not come except two things happen. There come a falling away first and the man of sin be revealed. So what did the Apostle Paul teach? He said the gathering together would not happen until the man of sin, the Antichrist, is revealed. Now in our second segment, we focused on the simultaneous harvest of the wheat and the tares. Jesus himself described it in Matthew chapter 13, verse number 30. Now, this is the same simultaneous harvest as is also described in Revelation chapter 14, verse 14 through 20. There's two harvests there. And then in Revelation 19, 7 through 21, it all happens almost simultaneously. The rapture of the church takes place, and then shortly thereafter, the battle of Armageddon. Now, in this segment... We will give answers to some of the common objections because people have a lot of questions. So we're going to answer objections to the post-tribulation rapture teaching. Remember, it's important to emphasize that whether you believe in a pre-trib rapture or a post-trib rapture is not a salvation issue. It's critical that all of us stay ready for eternity at all times because any of us could be caught out into eternity today. So that's the one thing we definitely want you to remember. Whatever you believe, pre-trib, post-trib, the most important thing is make sure that you stay ready. Now, I've asked my son-in-law, Dave Robbins, to be with us on the program uh, today because Dave answers a lot of our ministry calls for people who come here and Uh, Dave, wouldn't you say that the most frequently asked question that we have here at End Time is, why do you believe in a post-tribulation rapture? Absolutely. That's why I was so excited to make this video because uh, I would say 75 to 80 percent of the questions I get on the phones are people wanting to know, when will the rapture happen? Uh, You know, I suppose one reason is because uh, the majority probably believes in a pre-trib rapture. Mm -hmm. And when we teach that there's a post-trip rapture, and yet our case is so compelling. Mm-hmm. People call here and say, wait a minute, you're, you're playing with my brain here. So mm-hmm. uh, I, I understand totally because I was taught pre-trib all my life, mm-hmm. and I went through that uh, change myself, was forced to by Scripture. So consequently, I want you to come and pose some of the questions that you deal with on sure. an ongoing basis. Let's get started. 
Well, this first one is a very key point. It's 1 Thessalonians chapter 5, verse 9. And this, as well as other scriptures, state that God has not appointed us unto His wrath. Well, so since this scripture clearly indicates that the church will not experience God's wrath during the tribulation, tell me what you think. Well, obviously, God's not going to pour out His wrath on His church. Mm-hmm. Uh, a lot of people say, you don't think God's going to beat His bride just before He marries her. I mean, I've heard it all the time, mm-hmm. as you have. And the answer is, of course He's not. But the critical thing to understand is that the great tribulation is not the wrath of God. The great tribulation is the wrath of Satan. The wrath of God is poured out right at the last of the great tribulation and right at the time of the battle of Armageddon. In Revelation chapter number 12, there's a war in heaven, verse number 7. Satan, knowing he's about out of time, decides to try to overthrow God in the heavenlies one more time. He makes war against the angels of God. The Bible says Michael and his angels fought against the devil and his angels. Of course, Satan was defeated. And his punishment was that he was banished from any more appearing in the presence of God and confined to the earth. Right now, Satan can appear in the presence of God. He is the accuser of the brethren. But when he's cast down, here's what it actually says in verse 12 of chapter 12 of Revelation. Woe to the inhabitants of the earth and of the sea, for the devil has come down unto you having great wrath because he knoweth that he hath but a short time. He understands there's three and a half years left. Now, the passage goes on to say that Satan will then go persecute the woman Israel. The woman has 12 stars around her head, Mm -hmm. and the 12 stars symbolize the 12 tribes. So Satan will go, when he's cast down, he launches the great tribulation, Mm -hmm. and the full brunt of of it will come against Uh, the woman, which is Israel. And the Bible says he will persecute the woman for time, times, and half a time, which is three and a half years, Mm -hmm. uh, which is the length of the great tribulation. I know some people teach the seven-year tribulation, but that's not one time in the Bible, every place in the Bible, it states that it will be three and a half years. Okay, so it's clearly stated here that the great tribulation is the wrath of Satan. Satan comes down to you having great wrath. Mm -hmm knowing that he hath but a short time, and he launched his persecution against not only Israel, but also the disciples of Jesus Christ for time, times, and half a time. So the great tribulation is not the wrath of God. The great tribulation is the wrath of Satan. Now, the wrath of God is in the book of Revelation. It's in Revelation chapter number 16, under the seven vials of the wrath of God. Mm -hmm. And those are the vials of wrath that will be poured out on the invading armies that will be coming down against Israel at the time of the battle of Armageddon. So here's the thing to remember. The great tribulation is Satan making war against the saints. And the scripture says that to us repeatedly. Thank you. Okay, so the, the next one is a very important one that I get all the time. It's Second Thessalonians chapter 2, verse 7 through 8, and it states... For the mystery of lawlessness is already at work. Only he who now restrains will do so until he is taken out of the way. And then the lawless one will be revealed, whom the Lord will consume with the breath of his mouth and destroy with the brightness of his coming. So many people believe that the he which restrains is the church and that the restraining influence of the church must be removed at the rapture before the Antichrist can come into power. And... As you know, this is held by so many people. The church restrains the Antichrist from being Mm -hmm. revealed until the church is gone. He cannot be revealed. But is that really what this scripture is saying? Let's go back in verses 1 through 3. The apostle Paul taught adamantly that our gathering together unto him could not happen until the man of sin, the Antichrist, is revealed. Mm -hmm. Would he then turn around four verses later and say, oh, but the Antichrist can't be revealed until the church is gone? He says, verse 1 through 3, that uh, I beseech you by the coming of our Lord and our gathering together unto him that you understand that day shall not come until there's a falling away first and the man of sin be revealed. So the rapture cannot happen according to Paul in verse 3 until the Antichrist is revealed. He wouldn't turn right around And say, oh, but the Antichrist can't be revealed until the church is gone. It's an exactly contradictory statement. 
So then the time, uh, the, the question arises, if it's not the church that restrains, there is something restraining the revelation of the Antichrist. Mm-hmm. So the question is, what is it? Well, verse 6 uh, tells us what it is. It says, and now ye know what withholdeth or what restraineth, that he, the Antichrist, might be revealed in his time. It's the time clock of God that restrains. The Antichrist cannot come until it's time for him to come. To better understand this, let's look at Galatians chapter 4, verse number 4. It states there, But when the fullness of time was come, God sent forth his Son, made of a woman, made under the law. Now, Jesus couldn't come until the fullness of time came, until it was time for him to come. God had this all planned out. So even as the coming of Christ had to wait until the fullness of time came, likewise, the Antichrist cannot come until the fullness of time comes. So it's the time clock of God. Back to verse 6. Now you know what withholdeth that the Antichrist might be revealed in his time. One more thing. It states there that he that now restraineth will restrain. But you know, it can't be the church because the church is never referred to as a he. The church is referred to as the bride. A bride is not a he. The church is referred to as the bride. And therefore, this cannot be referring to the church as we have already demonstrated. Sure. Okay, here's a big one that I always get. Revelation chapter 4 verse 1 says, A voice called for the apostle John to come up hither. And immediately he was in heaven. Well, this is the, a lot of people think, well, this is a symbolic representation of the rapture of the church. Uh, And the church, of course, a lot of people say, well, the church is not mentioned again after Revelation 4, verse 1. So, since the church is not mentioned after Revelation 4, verse 1, according to a lot of people, does that mean that the church will then be be raptured out of here before the seals, trumpets, and vials occur? If people have studied this issue and read the commentaries, uh, they've read what you said. Most of the commentaries say that the rapture happens in chapter 4 and verse number 1. But is that true? Well, we need to understand how the book of Revelation is laid out. The book of Revelation has three categories. Revelation one nineteen describes them. It says there, John was told, Write the things which thou hast seen, and the things which are, and the things which shall be hereafter. So, three categories. Things thou hast seen, things which are, and the things which shall be hereafter. The things thou hast seen, and the things which are, are outlined in chapters 1, 2, and 3. Most of chapter 2 and 3 is devoted to seven churches that existed in Asia Minor at the time the book of Revelation was written. Uh, Most people believe that uh, John, after he got out of exile, returned to Turkey, and there was over those seven churches. So these were seven messages written to seven literal churches. Then in chapter number four, we go into the things which shall be hereafter. Let's read it. Uh, Revelation 4, 1. After this I looked, and behold, a door was opened in heaven, and the first voice which I heard was, as it were, the sound of a trumpet talking with me, which said, Come up hither, I will show thee things which must be hereafter. So now we move into the prophetic part of the book of Revelation. does not mean the rapture happened there. It just means we start considering the things which shall, in fact, be hereafter. Now, furthermore, we can prove that the first four seals of Revelation 6, the four horsemen of the apocalypse, we can prove they've already been unleashed. So consequently, we're already past chapter 4 right now, and the rapture hasn't happened yet. Now, furthermore, the teaching that the church is not seen after Revelation chapter number 4 is simply not true. We see the church in, in chapter 19, and the marriage hasn't even happened in chapter 19. Listen to verse 7 through 9. Let us be glad and rejoice and give honor to him for the marriage of the Lamb is come and his wife hath made herself ready. Hasn't even happened. And we're clear almost to the end of the book of Revelation. And to her was granted that she should be arrayed in fine linen, clean and white, for the fine linen is the righteous of the saints. And he saith unto me, 
right. Blessed are they that are called unto the marriage supper of the Lamb. So here we have the church is not just mentioned after chapter 4. It's mentioned here in chapter number 19. Uh, so it's very important for us to, to understand that the church is definitely mentioned in uh, Revelation after chapter number 4. Absolutely. Um, of course, you and I understand the 70 weeks uh, prophecy in Daniel 9. But let's look at it real close. Daniel 9.24 says, 70 weeks are determined upon thy people and upon thy holy city to finish the transgression and to make an end of sins and to make reconciliation for iniquity and to bring into everlasting righteousness and to seal up the vision and prophecy and to anoint the most holy. So here's, here's the question. Seventy weeks are, de- are determined upon thy people. Well, what people? What was the Lord, who was the Lord addressing? He was, of course, addressing Daniel, who was a Jew. So 70 weeks are determined upon thy people, the Jewish people. Um, so some say, well, this has nothing to do with the Gentile church or the bride of Christ. So let me ask you this question in, in, as a result. Doesn't this mean that the Gentiles will not be able to be saved during the time of Daniel's 70th week? Well, and what the people asking this question contend is, uh, if the 70 weeks pertains to God's deal with the Jews, and if the final seven years, which contains the three and a half year great tribulation, mm-hmm. if that's to do with the Jews, then there won't be any salvation of Gentiles during this 70th week, mm-hmm. this seven year period. And that's the thrust of this question. But to say that only Jews can be saved during the 70 weeks prophecy and that only Gentiles could be saved in the gap between the 69th and the 70th week is obviously not true. Now, let's make sure we understand because not everybody out here understands the 70 weeks prophecy. Uh, The prophecy basically says in Daniel 9, verse 24 through 26, that after seven weeks of years and 62 weeks of years, the Messiah will be cut off. Now, seven weeks of years, 62 weeks of years totals 483 years from the beginning of this prophecy until Messiah is cut off, which means the crucifixion. Mm -hmm. So we know that the first 69 weeks of years of this prophecy stops at the crucifixion. Yet, a great Jewish revival took place between the 69th week of years and the 70th week. Mm -hmm. So during this gap... The Jews are having great revival. If we're going to say the salvation for the Jews is only confined to Daniel's 70 weeks, I mean, there were several years in the New Testament church that the church was totally Jewish before Mm -hmm. God allowed the Gentiles to come in and be partakers. So here's the critical thing that we want to make sure. If the Gentiles are prohibited from being saved during the 70th week, which is what this question is implying, Mm -hmm then does that mean that the Jews cannot be saved during the gap period? Obviously, it's not true. So what is the truth? There were Jews and Gentiles in the early church together. It's obvious from the New Testament. There will be Jews and Gentiles in the last day church together. One more thing to consider. In Revelation chapter 7, verse 9 through 14, John saw a great multitude out of every kindred, tongue, peoples, and nations And the Bible says they came out of great tribulation and washed their robes in the blood of the Lamb. Mm -hmm. That means they're going to be getting saved. They're washing their robes in the blood of the Lamb during the final seven years, during the great tribulation. But it doesn't say they're Jews. It says they're out of every nation, kindred, and tongue. So obviously there's something faulty about this particular thinking. Sure. Well, I'm I'm absolutely thankful for that, actually. But, um, okay, so the, the alive and remaining... 1 Thessalonians 4, 16 through 17 states that at the rapture, the dead in Christ will rise from the dead first. Then we which are alive and remain on the earth will be caught up with them to meet the Lord in the air. So here's the question. Since everyone that receives the mark of the beast during the tribulation will be lost and everyone who refuses it will be killed, um, there can be no one at the end of the tribulation that can be alive and remaining. So... Therefore, the rapture happening at the end of the tribulation is not possible, right? Well, that's the question that's Mm -hmm. been presented to us. But there's a lot of big problems with that question because we know that there's going to be millions that go on into the millennium Mm -hmm. 
under the rulership of Jesus Christ and his church. Under this question, there won't even be anybody to populate the mm-hmm. earth during the millennium. So we see it's a really faulty question. Mm-hmm. But uh, first of all, the idea that the Antichrist will be in absolute control of the earth and that every person will either worship him and take the mark or else uh, they will be killed. That is faulty. That's simply not according to the scripture. Uh, For example, in Daniel chapter 11, verse 41, it states that the country of Jordan will never be under the power of the Antichrist. It says the children of Edom, Moab, and Ammon shall escape out of his hand. Mm -hmm. Well, that's all in the country of Jordan. So the Antichrist is never going to occupy Jordan. That's Daniel eleven forty one, And then in Revelation 12, verse number 14, it says, when the dragon persecutes the woman Israel, the woman with the 12 stars, it states there that there will be given to the woman two wings of a great eagle that she might fly into her place where she's nourished for time, times, and half a time from the face of the serpent. Her place is Israel. The nation of Israel will never be occupied by the Antichrist. That's the reason he tries to invade Israel at Armageddon. You don't invade a place if you are to control it. So consequently, Israel is not going to be under the power of the Antichrist. Then we have evidence that other places will not be under the power of the Antichrist. The Antichrist will dominate the world. Mm -hmm. He will be ruling the one world government. But there will be many places that will not be totally submissive to this one world government. For example, in Daniel chapter 11, verse 44, it says there... That during the great tribulation, tidings out of the east and out of the north shall trouble the Antichrist. So he'll go forth to make war against his opposers. And he will still be fighting enemies during the final three and a half years. Now, I'm really hoping the United States of America is one of those nations that's going to be opposing him during this final three and a half years. Mm -hmm. But it's important that we really realize that. Uh, So Daniel chapter 11, verse 32 through 35, describes the way things will really be. During this time of the great tribulation, listen to it. It says, And such as do wickedly against the covenant shall he, the Antichrist, corrupt by flatteries. But at this very same time, during the great tribulation, the people that do know their God shall be strong and do exploits. Verse 33, And they that understand among the people shall instruct many. We're going to be teaching people. Mm -hmm. We're going to be explaining prophecy. We're going to be putting out uh, lessons like this one today. And yet they will fall by the sword, by flame, by captivity, by spoil, many days. There will be people that will be killed by the Antichrist during the Great Tribulation. Now when they shall fall, they shall be helped with a little help, but many shall cleave to them with flatteries and Some of them of understanding shall fall to try them, to purge them, to make them white. Even people who understand the prophecies will yield to the pressure of the time, even to the time of the end, because it is yet for a time appointed. So who will populate the earth into the millennium? You know, in Daniel chapter 7, we have a prophecy of modern nations, Great Britain, the United States, Russia, Germany, and the countries of the the European Union. Mm -hmm. And it states there in verse number 11 that when Jesus comes to take over the earth, that he will put the Antichrist in the lake of fire. And verse 12 says, but as concerning the rest of the nations, it says the rest of the beast, and it mm-hmm. says in the chapter of the beast are nations. As concerning the rest of the nations, they have their dominion taken away, but their lives are prolonged for a season and a time. Those nations will be allowed to live into the millennium under the rulership of Jesus Christ and his, and his church. I can't tell you for sure exactly the criteria that God will use. We know that when the children of Israel refused to go into the promised land, that the Lord didn't require that decision of all that were below 20. Well, there's 2 billion people on earth today below 20. Mm -hmm. So it could be them. I can't tell you that for sure. Nevertheless, those will be the people that will populate the earth during the uh, millennial reign period. Sure. Well, it looks like we've run out of time for this segment. So if you'd be so kind... Please just give us a summary of what we learned today. Well, I think the thing we need to do, Dave, is to talk to everyone about, is this issue important? Well, of course it's important. It's in God's Word. However, I would remind you, this is not a salvation issue. This is not something that Christians need to be divided over, that church just need to be filled with contention about. That's not what this is all about. However, If we are going to be here throughout the Great Tribulation period, our attitude toward this and believing what the Bible says about it will affect uh, our attitude towards the end time. In other words, should we be 
uh, thinking that one day we'll be walking along the street and all of a sudden we'll just disappear and that's it? Or should we realize that all these prophecies are converging right now and that we should be gearing up our personal lives and the church for the greatest revival thrust the world has ever known? We're going to be watching these prophecies be fulfilled. We're going to be able to use them as evangelism material. It's going to be a great opportunity for evangelism. Now, we shouldn't be thinking about, well, what's going to happen to me? Because, you know, when you're giving your life to Jesus Christ, it doesn't matter. We're here for him. There's one other thing that I think is really important, and that is if we are so sold out to a pre tribulation rapture belief, and then it doesn't happen, how could that affect us? Let's say the mark of the beast comes along, and you say, Well, I'm not going to be here when the real mark of the beast happens, so I can do this. Now, this is the big danger because just leave a little room in case. The post-trib rapture is right, that if this comes along, you would not take it. That's the biggest thing I see in all this, and that we should believe things correctly. So, in conclusion today, my final word to you is one thing. Whatever you do, be ready. 